please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Howard McLeod. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I um, have the uh, uh, conflict of interest shown here and, um, for, uh, for uh, completion. So it's, uh, it's great to be back here and to uh, have a chance to, to catch up with what's happening uh, here on campus and also to update you a little bit on what's going on in the field of pharmacogenomics. And the, the issue around uh, that we're trying to solve with pharmacogenomics ha hasn't changed and, and never will change. And, and that is that we now have many different active therapies for the treatment of most diseases. And the, the changes that will occur will be that there will be even more therapeutic options for, for these diseases. And I'm sure you have your favorite disease that does not currently have a therapy, so it's, it's most diseases. But for, for many of the common diseases, we have a lot of different choices uh, to, to make. If you take something common like high blood pressure, there are over 100 FDA-approved drugs or drug combinations for the treatment of high blood pressure. And so how do you sit down and pick one of them for uh, the, the initial treatment of a, a, a given patient? And, and too often what we do is pick something that we're familiar with or that we know how to spell or that we have some sort of affinity to uh, that would cause us to start with that medicine. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else in a different class or, or a different, different type of family of some, some sort. Um, and, and so that really speaks to the need for something more precise in, in how we choose from amongst the, the various uh, 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 medicines that are out there. Often we're taught medicine as if it's a Michelin three-star restaurant. And if you've had the good fortune to be at one of those restaurants, you go there and you don't, there's no menu. There's a list of what you're going to receive because the chef has chosen it. And there's a bunch of things that are very small and have a French name. Um, it tastes amazing and you wonder what that was. Um, but uh, you, you don't have a choice. It's, here is the menu. Um, really, we're much more like Golden Corral where you go in there and there's 20 different entrees. And if you don't like one of the entrees, you pick one of the other 19 entrees uh, and, and, and go with that. Or too often you pick more than one of the other 19 entrees. And the, the idea that we have all these choices to make um, is, is a very different way of thinking uh, than, uh, than, than we're normally taught. Uh, really, we need to be thinking about how do we best choose from amongst these options and how do we choose what the next therapy would be should that not work? Um, and it's, it's a different philosophy that we need to start building on. And the reason why we need to do that is that there is so much variation in, in the response to uh, most every type of, of therapy. If you work in bone disease, uh, bisphosphonates are quite effective and there's not a, as much variability there. With some bacterial infections, not a lot of variability in response. But in most other areas, important areas like, like uh, uh, psychiatric disease, cancer, uh, viral diseases, HIV, hepatitis, um, the, uh, many of the other diseases that, that you work on, uh, there's variation. Someone will respond to the most common therapy. About half the people won't. They need a different therapy. Half of those people will respond. Eventually, you might find a therapy for everyone. But it won't be the same therapy in, in the way that we, we normally think about it. And so understanding that variability um, is, is part of the goal. And just to be clear, the goal is not to be perfect right away. If we could choose from amongst those 100 FDA-approved antihypertensive drugs and narrow it down to 25 drugs, that would be an advance. We want to go down to the point where we know exactly the medicine that's the right one for you. But even in advance of filtering down to a smaller group to choose from would be an important advance, ruling out some of the other options that are there. And, and so this, you know, enemy, uh, good is the enemy of, your great is the enemy of, of, of perfect, or good is the enemy of great, or whatever you want to like to say it. Um, the, the, the idea that we could be smarter than we are now is, is really the goal. Toxicities also remain unpredictable. And when you look at the, the reasons why uh, medicines don't work, sometimes it's because of the biology. Sometimes it's because the patients don't take the medicine. I, I know from uh, uh, one, of the, one of the big advances that has been made over the last couple of decades, the, the statin therapies for cholesterol. Um, these medicines, if taken, uh, will have a significant public health impact. But at the end of the first year of prescription, only one third of patients are still taking the medicine as prescribed. Many of them have, have stopped altogether. 
And I know from my own parents that uh, when taking a statin, they had a, a family reunion coming up, or they were going on a cruise, or there was something happening. They didn't really like the muscle pain. They just stopped it for, you know, just for a week or two, just to feel better, and then forgot to start it back up. And so many of the, the, uh, the advances that we have with medicines will only happen if the patients take the medicines. And too often, the adverse events, the unpredictable toxicities of our, our, uh, are part of that. And then, of course, there's the issue that none of us want to acknowledge. Um, and that is that these medicines actually cost money. And who knew? <laughs> I mean, the Europeans knew. But, but the, we, we really have a situation where uh, we, we can no longer ignore that factor. If you're well insured, you will likely have a 10% copay um, on your insurance. And if you're taking one of the, the new amazing anti-cancer drugs, they can be as much as $20,000 per month. So if you're spending $2,000 of your own money, your, your copay for that month, on something, uh, typically when you spend $2,000 per month, you've chosen what color it was, whether it had leather seats, satellite radio, other things like that. Uh, usually a, a Triton at the front, Maserati in the back, you know, it, it, the, these sorts of things. Um, and instead, you're spending them on a medicine that, that may or may not work. And so we have some changes that have occurred in terms of, of the way we think about things, even for the well-insured. And this idea of, of value um, is something that, that has to be part of our equation. And I know, uh, at least I can only speak for myself, I, I hate the idea of having to even think about that. But if we're going to take our science and make it real, uh, we, we have to have some of these realities at least be part of the late translational phase uh, for this. Now, when we approach uh, these sorts of problems, uh, typically we, we, uh, we think about it as a, as a yes, no type of, you're gonna respond, you're not gonna respond, or you're gonna get the, the side effect, you're not gonna get the side effect. In, in reality, probability or probabilistic data is enough. You know, I mentioned the, uh, the statin medicines. Uh, you don't take statins uh, ap be because someone just had a heart attack. I mean, actually, you, you do for secondary prevention, but you, you try to take it early to decrease the probability of having a coronary event. Same with anti-diabetic drugs. You don't wait until someone has lost a kidney or gone blind uh, to start treating their, their, uh, their diabetes. When you see uncontrolled glucose, you try to control it now to decrease the probability uh, that that sort of, uh, those kind of in, in organ effects will, will occur. S same with antihypertensives. You don't wait for a stroke, you treat it now to decrease the probability of a stroke. And, and most of our preventive medicine is that same way. Here's a, an inc in, uh, increasing age on the x-axis, increasing number of cases on the y-axis for colon cancer. And you see at a, right about this age here, there's an inflection point, the number of cases go up. That's when you start offering um, uh, colonoscopy uh, to, to try to detect early cases, polyps or early cases of cancer, uh, to try to deal with that in, in, that, uh, in that very treatable stage. And so the, the concepts are, are there. Um, but yet when it comes to medicines, uh, we, we don't really approach it in that, that same way. Um, and it's time to, to start thinking about what is the science behind this? What is the epidemiology behind this? And, and can we act on it? <clears throat> now the reason to focus on, on uh, medicines is that uh, they're an important part of, of our, our treatment for most diseases, but they're also an important um, cause of, of morbidity and mortality in this country. They're, they're the, at least the most recent reports, um, have the adverse drug reactions as the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. There was a report uh, from last night from the British Medical Journal uh, showing that, there's a study from Johns Hopkins, um, showing that uh, uh, adverse events in general, not just the drug events, were the third leading cause of mortality in the United States. So it, it's, uh, you know, medical mistakes, including those around medicines, are an important issue that we need to deal with. And you know, the, if you look at other industries, the way they've dealt with, with errors um, is much more systematic and must, much uh, more objective uh, than, than uh, we currently approach things in, this, in the biomedical sciences. And so there's some opportunities to, to, to go there. Uh, adverse events are, are heavily litigated. Uh, many of these things are, are predictable. And so there's, there's an opportunity. Uh, when, when we look at um, not only are the, the, the uh, large number of cases of, of death, uh, but a lot of emergency room visits, 
um, that, that can occur. And if you look at a place like uh, in psychiatric uh, areas, um, you see um, almost 90,000 patients uh, visit the emergency department each year uh, due to an, a, a drug-induced adverse event just in the psychiatric area alone. So the problem uh, is, is quite a, a su substantial one. Uh, and every, if you happen to go to an emergency department and you wonder why there's so many people there, some of them will be uh, because of the medicines. Now, sometimes it's the patient uh, not doing what they're supposed to. So if you take a full dose of insulin and then you forget to eat, um, you know, you've contributed to the reason why you need to go to the emergency department. If you take uh, uh, too many of your, your pain meds, um, you, you, know, I, you may have needed them, but um, there is um, a, uh, a, a patient component of that. Um, but often the, the uh, difficulties are things that are not predictable and not related to dose. Um, and in, in that case, uh, there, there are, in many cases, genomic reasons why we could, we could act on that. I mentioned before that these therapies are expensive, and so there's an opportunity for value. It could be that $2,000 per month for that anti-cancer drug I mentioned before is a fantastic value um, because you have the, the, uh, the quality divided by cost uh, equation for, for value. Um, or it could be that it's a, a complete waste of money um, and you need to know that and move on to something else. And so the, the idea that we can be uh, looking at what is the end game and moving uh, towards the more basic elements is really important as we look at these endpoints. And you know, some of these things are, will require human studies. It's uh, kind of difficult to, to do some of these studies in mice. Uh, they don't have a, a uh, they're not insured, they don't have a health, health budget for each year. Um, but the, the idea of doing some of these mechanistic studies to drive it towards these endpoints is, is very important. Now, the things I've been talking about in terms of framing the, the clinical problem for, for medications, um, the solutions have had a number of different names over the, the, uh, the decades. Uh, they, they've been called uh, personalized medicine, stratified medicine, individualized therapy, patient-driven medicine, tailored therapy if you're in the UK, um, as I'll show you in the next um, one of the follow slides is pharmacogenetics, pharmacogenomics. Uh, but last year when the president called it precision medicine, uh, we, we now all call what we do precision medicine. And the reason why we call it precision medicine is really simple. The chances of getting funded are much higher if we call it precision medicine. <laughs> the, the reality is we're not very precise. I don't like using the word precision medicine outside of a grant application because I don't think we're very precise. Precision medicine uh, is more of an aspirational term. Someday we may be precise in the way that we prescribe medicines, uh, and as opposed to what is reality now. Um, and, and so it is a goal. It is something we need to work towards, uh, uh, but it is, is definitely just an opportunity. Now, the, the circles here, uh, back in, in the uh, late 50s, uh, the term pharmacogenetics was, was coined. It first uh, came in, at least in the English print uh, at that time. And that was referring to some of the interactions uh, between the, the genome in twins um, and um, response to medications and showing that there was a, a, a heritable component um, and uh, at least inferring that there were some genetics uh, involved in, in that. The genes weren't known, but the term was, was applied. Uh, with the Human Genome Project, uh, we had to convert to genomics because we're looking at more than one gene. Uh, we're looking at multiple genes. It's a, it's a genome of opportunity uh, to try to understand the drugs, and therefore it was, it was made forward. As we started taking this into practice, it, it became uh, personalized medicine in, in terms of trying to uh, take patient factors and understand how to combine them with things like genomic data uh, to individualize the, the choice of therapy or the choice of dose or, or the choice of monitoring that you might do uh, for a given patient. And then as mentioned, precision medicine is now taking this on in a, a much broader sense, uh, trying to really look at multiple fa uh, factors uh, of, of patient data, much more than one can, can think about using your own brain uh, to try to really pull this together to, to guide patient care. And, and I won't spend a lot of time on that except at the very end come back to it. Um, but I but, uh, wanted to put that framework because, you know, there's so much buzz around uh, precision medicine right now. But in reality, um, it's just part of a natural progression of trying to take things like the genome um, and understand how do we become more realistic? How do we add some of the layers of complexity uh, that are there, that are real, um, and, and put them forward? Uh, the idea that one gene uh, will, will drive um, most any disease 
is just not true. Take a, a great example like cystic fibrosis. Uh, there, there are, uh, there's a lot of variability um, amongst patients who have the, the same uh, genetic variants. And some of that is due to other genetic modifiers. Some of that is due to how aggressive they've been with, with a um, pulmonary hygiene and other aspects. Um, and it all comes together to, to focus in on a, a patient and their lung function. And the same is true around many of these other areas, including medicine. Uh, we need to know other aspects of the patient to really pull it together. The other thing is that personalized medicine, that precision medicine, pharm pharmacogenomics, whatever you want to call it, um, has, has really always been part of, of the way medicine is practiced. There, there's always been a component where a, a, a doctor has looked at the patient, had some attribute about their lifestyle or about their size or about some other feature, um, and used it. Um, I, during part of my uh, training, I went to spend one year in Scotland and ended up staying over there on faculty for, uh, for eight years. And part of that time was up at Aberdeen where uh, they were having their 500 year anniversary as a medical school, 1495 is when they were founded. Um, and uh, so they had a great library. And so you could go in and had to put the funny gloves on and uh, cotton gloves and you could look at some of the old texts. And uh, once you got to know uh, that uh, an F was actually an S and all these other copper print uh, uh, type of, of things, you could read some of these old texts. And I read a, an, eight, an old translation of an of a even older Greek uh, 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 book that talked about how they had the patient pee on the ground, and if certain types of worms or flies appeared at that spot, they would give them this kind of bark. And if a different type of bug or worm or fly came up at that spot, they would give them another type of bark. So the, the idea of personalizing medicine is not new. The idea of using biomarkers to drive therapy is not new. Now, that was not a CLIA-approved assay. There were some, I'm sure, some regulatory issues around where you peed on the ground for that. But the concept of taking individual patient data and, and selecting a therapy um, has been around for a long time. It's just that the level of, of uh, precision, I guess, um, that we're applying has, has uh, changed and improved as we go forward. But medicine will, will never be truly personalized. I, I know your mom told you you were special, but you're amongst a group of special people. You're not the only one that's special. Um, I have a, a, a little mug that says um, world's greatest dad. And it was such a disappointment when I, one of my colleagues had an, his own mug that said world's greatest dad. Um, I don't know what my kids were thinking giving him that mug, but, but the, uh, the, the idea that, that uh, we, you know, we think we're, we're special and we need our medicine uh, will, will never occur for practical reasons, for cost, for, for other uh, uh, elements, regulatory elements. But we can make it so that from amongst the medicines that are out there, the ones that are most likely to have the highest probability of working uh, will, will be there. Now, some of this is all good to the next slide is, is towards issues like greater customer accountability. And, and those of us on the more clinical side just hate terms like that. Um, but, but for some of the reasons I already mentioned in terms of the amount of contribution patients are making now to the cost of care, um, that's becoming a feature. Um, and then uh, that's changing really uh, the, the practical expectations, the process. I mean, if, you don't, if you're a health system and don't have an app uh, for someone to be able to pull it out and look at their chart and, and uh, order a refill or medicine or whatever, um, you know, they're going to try to move on to a health system that does. And so there are practical things that are, that are out there that are really driving, uh, driving this forward. Now, the technology um, is, has been a, a big driver for, for uh, pharmacogenomics, personalized medicine, precision medicine, uh, especially over, even the last five years. Uh, the, the amount that one can do is, is just astounding. And if you, if you think back 10 years, which is, I know it's hard to do, uh, it, it's amazing what, uh, you know, we have, have summer students that come in and can generate more data uh, and uh, interpret that data uh, better uh, than a, a whole lab full of PhDs could uh, 10 years before that. It, you know, because things are not as handcrafted as they used to be, you can now do things in massively parallel uh, uh, approaches. And so the technology is there. We can look at many different genes in a very rapid fashion. There's, there's even some technologies where you can take something that uh, basically plugs into your iPhone, spit on it, uh, but wait 12 minutes, and get it up to five uh, SNP genotypes back. And so in, in some places like the intensive care unit, you can get a genotype result back faster than you can get a blood gas back uh, and, and have some results in which to, to act on. Infectious disease is changing dramatically because of the technology where uh, the idea that, that one would wait for a culture to come back 
is, is becoming uh, a foreign uh, part of, or a part of the history of medicine um, because one can get more rapid turnaround, especially in, in uh, CNS infection, uh, rapid turnaround results on whether this is virus, fungus, uh, uh, whatever it might be, and, and act on it accordingly. I mentioned about the, the patient burden. If, if you're paying more, you want to have more say, and that's, uh, that's natural, and we definitely see that out on the, on the clinical side. There's less personalized care. Um, if you are lucky, uh, I, I have a doctor that I, that I go to, and it's kind of an old-fashioned notion these days. Um, many people go to a clinic and uh, might have a, a doctor of record, but if they're not available, we'll see one of the other doctors that are there for that practice. Um, and that's become uh, more common, and certainly there's, there's elements there. Um, and, then, and then the issues of, of uh, even, even countries like the United States can't really afford to treat 100% 100, uh, 100 of people with an ex expensive medicine that will only benefit uh, about one-fifth of the patients. And certainly in the cancer area, uh, it's, it's relatively common uh, that uh, drugs will work in a 20% in a subset of patients, um, yet we don't often know who those are until after treatment. And so that, that, that has certainly been a, a big driver of, of how things go forward. Now, one of these last background slides is I put up there just because it, it's often really easy to get lost in your, your favorite technology. Uh, you know, this is a, geno a genomic series, so uh, there's a lot of focus on, on, uh, on, on DNA and, and uh, you know, could be copy number of DNA or methylation of DNA, but DNA, there's, there's um, you know, you could also expand this out to protein or RNA functional imaging, blood levels, circulating tumor cells in the case of cancer, other, other, t other measures like that. Lots of different ways of, of trying to measure a patient and understand what is it about them that would cause you to do uh, one type of treatment versus another type of treatment. And, and I, I mention all these, and not that, it's an, an, not that it is an exhaustive list, but it shows there, there's more than one way of, of trying to do this. And you know, too often, it's the old, uh, you know, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail type situation where, you know, we do DNA genome science, therefore the answer, it doesn't matter what the question is, the answer is DNA genome science. Um, and really the answers are going to be as we combine these things. Now I'm going to use a, the, a lot of DNA examples in the remaining time, but part of that is because of the practicality that DNA uh, technology is ready, it's, it's being uh, used, it's great for discoveries, it has application on the clinical side, uh, whereas some of the other technologies are not quite that, that far along. Um, DNA is also quite easy to obtain. You know, DNA is very stable. Uh, it, you know, you got DNA from King Tut, you know, you get DNA from, from a lot of uh, different things. Um, DNA is, is also, uh, a, you can really get it almost anywhere in the world and it'll be stable enough to get to a laboratory. Uh, you can get DNA from, from blood, from buccal scrapings, from hair follicles. I like to joke that you can get DNA from anything except OJ's glove. You know, so it's basically there's lots of different ways of getting DNA um, that can be valuable to, to the, the patient. Um, and so uh, I'll talk about DNA, but really as we're thinking about how do we take this forward, it's taking whatever is robust in helping us look at the patient and, and try to drive that into, into practice. Last little background piece is just a reminder that as we get towards the patient side of things, we, we have to deal with the complexities that patients have more than one uh, set of genomes. Uh, in this example, there's a, a tumor genome uh, and the normal genomes, and you know, this might be toxicity and efficacy if you want to keep it in a more simplistic uh, type of, of model. Um, but the same is true with viral disease, and for there's some data that even things like heart failure um, have a somatic component. Uh, in terms of, of changes that have occurred um, over time. And so the idea that, that um, we have this simplistic model where we can measure a genome and that a genome will be important for a patient um, is really uh, not true. Um, and we, we need to be ready and be thinking about, all right, how do we deal with multiple genomes uh, and, and the way they're, they're applied? Now, pharmacogenomics uh, is, is not uh, new, as I, as I mentioned nor is it something that uh, will, will start happening in the, in the future. Um, it's something where there are changes already. Now, there are over 160 drugs where the FDA has put genomic information somewhere in the package insert. So you know when you pick up your prescription and they take out the bottle and there's that wad of paper at the bottom? I'm not recommending you read it, but I would like you to recycle it. 
Um, so as you pull it out, if you happen to read it, there's a, a bunch of different sections that talk about uh, dosing and administration or toxicities or this or that. Um, and somewhere within that, around 160 drugs have genomic information. A smaller list, and it's, it's, um, most of them are shown here on this page, um, have, it, have genomics in the dosing and administration section. And that's the section that is uh, supposed to be read by prescribers. And it is read by uh, the, the app makers that prescribers use, um, at least. Um, it's read by insurance companies, uh, and it's also read by litigators. So there's uh, the kind of the, the three main audiences of that section. And these are examples where, uh, in some cases here, it's from here up, uh, changes in tumor. Uh, some of these where the FDA has approved the drug, uh, you know, this drug for only p patients who have this, mut this translocation or this translocation, or this mut mutations in this gene for the, this drug's case, and the list goes on. Um, and, and so, you have examples where it's very specific, um, and you have others where it's, it's really more of, of, uh, of, of general prognostic terms. You have also germline examples, normal DNA examples, where it could be metabolism, it could be uh, the immune system in terms of hypersensitivity reaction, uh, it could be a, a response to certain medicines, the case of, of cystic fibrosis. But the, the idea that genomic information is already out there uh, for, for use um, is, is uh, something that's been around for a while and is growing each, each year. The FDA has a nice site that has the, these, these examples that one could easily pull up. Now, very few of these examples are, uh, are such that, that it would be malpractice to manage a patient without testing. Certainly in the germline side, I, I would say really only the Abacavir example uh, would be a, a, a malpractice type of situation. But rather, there's information saying, well, if you have this genetic information, here's what you can do with it in terms of starting with a lower dose or starting with a higher dose or whatever it might be uh, for, for that. And so it's the type of information that is, is valuable if you have it already, but unless you're an early adopter, you're not going to necessarily order that test. And so you see some areas like, like uh, HIV with Abacavir uh, that, that um, pretty much every HIV patient is evaluated for this particular HLA molecule, if I get the arrow back, um, to, to identify risk of hypersensitivity reaction. Whereas you take some of the other examples and it's much less common uh, for, uh, for the genomics to be, be applied. Even for the same gene, uh, this gene here is, is important for uh, nausea and vomiting, for antidepressants, pain control. You'll see the psychiatrist doing a lot more testing uh, than the oncologist. Uh, for uh, even though they, you know, the oncologist might use a lot more of certain medicines. And so uh, some of it is, is, is cultural, if you will, in terms of early adopting personalities uh, vers versus um, otherwise. The other thing is even within an area like cancer, where there's a lot of activity around tumor sequencing, there's still a lot of elements where the germline, uh, the normal genome, is important for medicines that are there. So pain control, nausea and vomiting control, antidepressants, stimulants, and, uh, blood thinners, uh, all have a genomic component in the dosing administration section. Um, and at least some centers are now using more of this information um, as, it's, as it's applied. There are guidelines that are now being produced. So there's something called CPIC, uh, the, the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. Uh, there, there's a, uh, around uh, 140 institutions in 23, I think it is, countries uh, that, that are involved in putting together uh, a large number of different guidelines uh, that are available on the, the Pharm, uh, PharmGKB, the Pharmacogenomics Knowledge Base uh, .org, uh, website. Um, and these guidelines are now working their way into the National Registry and other, other places where guidelines are, are, are produced. And so the, the field is maturing from, from that standpoint. The, uh, the way things are being applied in, in pharmacogenomics are, are really uh, around the, the testing for avoidance in, in uh, many cases, and that is identifying a patient who would have a high risk of a hypersensitivity reaction or a bad reaction, try to avoid using that medicine. Um, testing for inclusion, so with some of the cancer examples, if you, if you have a particular variant, you are eligible to have that medicine. If you don't have it, you are not eligible type of, of thing. Um, stratification in terms of whether someone is high risk or low needs to have a different type of therapy. And then testing for explanation. That's my, my term for that. It's basically someone ha takes a medicine, something really bad happens to them, and you want to figure out why. Um, and so often you'll see testing done to say, well, 
did that patient crash and burn because of this genetic problem? And if so, I will now avoid a whole class of medicines, or was it something else of which now the whole uh, therapies are available uh, to be used? And so that, that, uh, that idea is, is being applied. And so you see it for areas like, like pain control. Now, there is no prospective randomized trial that I'm aware of that has done genotype-guided pain control versus not genotype-guided pain control. But there are studies showing, for example, with, with codeine, that if you have the extra copies of the gene, you'll convert it to morphine more, more quickly. And there have been a number of fatalities with uh, neonates and in the pediatric uh, situation to the point where many pediatric centers no longer use codeine at all. You know, they don't genotype the patient, they just don't use the drug at all uh, because of, of these, these situations. It also really highlights the issue. If you have an awesome therapy and a not so awesome therapy, it would take an amazing uh, bit of data for you to not use the awesome uh, therapy. That's a generic name, not a brand name. Uh, and so awesome is gonna rule every time. But if you have two equal options and you have to pick one for the patient, I mean, even a feather of data would cause you to shift one way or the other in terms of choosing that medicine. Uh, and so really much of medicine is tiebreaker type decisions where you've got a number of equal options. You've got a number of different ways of treating pain. And if you knew that oxycodone uh, will work much of the time but not all the time in someone who is deficient for this particular gene, you would shift to something that, that doesn't require uh, that, that particular medicine. They're not all shown here, but uh, for, for example, hydromorphone or some of the other drugs that don't require metabolic activation. Um, you know, the idea that 10% of patients uh, cannot activate a pain med and that uh, somewhere between 3 and 5% hyperactivate a pain med means that somewhere between 10 and 15% of all your patients are going to have trouble with those medicines. Um, and that's a, that's a big percentage uh, just based on one gene and one class of drugs. And so the, the idea that, that we can start using this information not to choose whether someone gets Mimesa or not uh, bl blindly, but rather shifting the scale uh, uh, to one versus another is, is the way we're seeing this starting to play out. Same with antiemetics. Uh, again, there's a number of different medicines. If you're an anesthesiologist, you're used to using endansetron. And you don't want to use another medicine. That endansetron is the one that's worked. Uh, anesthesiologists are a very fine-tuned group of individual, they, they, individuals. They, they have very clear um, protocols in terms of how they do things. They are the most objective, uh, or at least I think, the most objective practitioners of, of medicine among all the different specialties. Um, and they need a good reason to not do what they normally do. Um, and so we're seeing even our own anesthesiologists now using CYP2D6 to tip the scale uh, from using Adansetron to one of these other medicines. Um, I suggested they just stop using Adansetron, but no, that's, that's what they're used to using. Um, and then I said, well, it's only 3% of patients that have extra copies of CYP2D6, so do you, do you really care? Um, and uh, they looked at me funny, saying, we, we worry about a 1 in 1,000 event. 3% is huge in our world. And so, again, it comes back to the context. If you ask an oncologist, uh, if he's or she is worried about 3% of the patients having nausea and vomiting, they would say, we would be delighted if it was only 3%. If you ask the anesthesiologist, they're terrified of 3%. So again, context really matters as we see this start to be applied. And then the last little background piece is around, uh, is there enough of, uh, uh, are there enough patients with these abnormalities to really make it worthwhile? And so we've seen places like Vanderbilt and, and uh, Moffitt and others start to do preemptive type genomics. And so this is a paper from uh, almost two years ago now, came out of Vanderbilt, and they looked at this example for clopidogrel the, the, uh, in the cardiac situation, one of the statins, uh, this, gen this genotype affects m muscle pain for the statins. Uh, these genes have influenced the dose of warfarin, the blood thinner. Uh, this gene influences uh, whether you're gonna get neutropenia, severe neutropenia from uh, this medicine for arthritis and, and uh, dermatologic disorders, GI disorders, and leukemia. Um, here's a, in the solid organ transplant setting, this particular immunosuppressant. Um, and if you look in some of them, they're, there's very common. The yellow is, is at least one actionable variant. Some of these, it's, it's quite common to have an actionable variant. Others, it's, it's much less common. And then it's very rare for there to be an extreme risk uh, type of variant. But when you add it all together, 
86.5% of patients had at, le at least one actionable variant, and an additional almost 5% had a, a high-risk variant. And so it ends up being over 90% of patients, just with these five examples, over 90% of patients had something that was actionable in, in terms of preemptively preparing for the choice of medicine. Now, if you are choosing a statin and you don't have genomic information, you might want to just start with one now. But if you had that information already, it would cause you to shift from one to versus another. Just like you may not uh, really want to know someone's organ dysfunction or you know, re renal dysfunction, but if you know that they um, have a creatinine clearance of 40, you're going to adjust a renal excreted drug, um, even if there's not a randomized clinical trial showing exactly what you should do. Um, and so what we're seeing now is this with these pre preemptive strategies, um, more uh, genomics being done uh, when the patient arrives at the health system um, so that it's preloaded into the electronic medical record and can be acted on as we go forward. But these and, and the follow-on studies have shown that it's not the minority of patients that have something uh, to think about. It, it's the majority uh, that have something to, that, to prepare for as, as you change, uh, change practice. Now, there, there's a still shifting, shifting gears to, to uh, the more uh, uh, basic discovery elements. There's still a lot of discovery that's needed. There are, are very few uh, precision medicine, pharmacogenomics, whatever you want to call it, uh, genome-wide association studies, and even fewer where next-generation sequencing has been applied. They're starting to come out, but if you look in the, the, G, the NHGRI GWASH uh, catalog, uh, it's, it's somewhere around 4% of the phenotypes are drug-related in some way, and that's any type of medicine, psychiatric meds, cancer meds, et cetera. A very small number of investigations have been done. And if you look at the number of patients and uh, people across the country that get a prescription medicine, uh, and you look at what those prescription medicines are, uh, very little has been done uh, to, to really understand uh, how do genes influence the choice of medicine, the choice of dose, the choice of monitoring for a, for a given patient. And so there's a lot of work still to be done uh, for that. Part of the issue as well is that replication data sets are difficult to obtain. So w one example that, that um, it wasn't planned, but that came online this morning <laughs> um, was a, uh, a study that we did out of the NCI's um, Clinical Trials Cooperative Group. In this case, uh, the, they're one, of the, one of the groups called the Alliance um, did this particular trial. It used to be Cancer and Leukemia Group B. Uh, it was the historic name for that particular study. And, and so this was in, in prostate cancer, people who had advanced prostate cancer. And they were given this particular chemotherapy drug uh, plus a placebo or this chemotherapy drug plus an antivascular agent. And the, the bottom line was that the addition of the antivascular agent did not change overall survival uh, for, for the patients. It did change progression-free survival, but overall survival was the primary endpoint. But we could go in then and look at the different uh, toxicities that occurred uh, for these patients. And so there's just over 1,000 patients, of which um, 864 registered for the pharmacogenomic study. And then when you filter out some of the, the filters for population stratification, it ends up with just over 600 patients on which uh, we, could, we could study for, for the initial phase. And there's a number of endpoints one can look at for these kinds of studies. So the chemotherapy drug causes neutropenia and causes uh, neuropathy. The uh, antivascular agent causes high blood pressure, protein in the urine, uh, clotting, and bleeding. Um, and so we can look at these different features and look at uh, what are the genome predictors uh, of, these, of these particular endpoints. I'll skip that in the interest of time. So one can go in and, and uh, do a model. Uh, for example, for neuropathy, which I'll show you some, some data from uh, right now, um, that was the paper that, that came out this morning. Um, and for, for neuropathy, one could go in and include as well the, this variant cofactor. So if someone already has long-standing diabetes, they're, they're going to either have or be at high risk for neuropathy. One needs to know that as we're looking at drug-induced uh, effects. What is the baseline that's there? So the, the models we would use in the past were relatively simple. Here's a group of patients treated with this drug. This drug causes neuropathy as one of its side effects. We look at who experienced neuropathy. Maybe we normalize it per dose, so we can take into account dose adjustments that, that had occurred. And who completed the two years without getting neuropathy. And so that's very much a yes-no type of model. But unfortunately, we have all these competing risks that occur. Um, there, there are patients that stop the drug because their disease 
progressed. There are others that, that died while on therapy. Some that, that um, had some other severe toxicity that caused them to stop taking the medicine. Um, others still that just got fed up with being on the trial and decided to go do something else. Uh, and, and you know, they're allowed to do that. Um, and we have to take into, into account. And so by, by taking a more complex model, a, a competing risk analysis model, one can then go in and basically functionally do censoring um, around these different events. Because if someone withdrew from a study um, after the second cycle of therapy, they didn't have enough time to get neuropathy. Um, even, they might have gotten it, but to, to include them in the no neuropathy group would really be a, a, a false thing. And, and part of that is because the, the, um, what's shown here are a number of different uh, endpoints. Um, in black is death or pro disease progression. Um, green, it's, it's um, other treatment associated adverse events. And you see early on, it, it's these other events that are occurring. And so there's a lot of other events, non-neuropathy events, neuropathy shown in red, that, that are competing here. And so these patients that had these events never had a chance to really get neuropathy. And so we need to model them accordingly. And the reason for belaboring this point is that there are so few pharmacogenomic studies. I would hate for us to go and do some and use inappropriate statistical models. We, every one of the studies that are done are precious. We don't have enough. You know, if you're doing studies in diabetes, there are so many diabetes studies that you could have a few crappy ones because they'll be overwhelmed by some great ones. But for, for pharmacogenomics, we, we don't have enough studies. We need to do them well. And so going in with some kind of, you know, hey, I have Excel, I can do statistics type of mindset um, really needs to be overcome. And as we're, as we're thinking about these, these approaches, and uh, especially in, in, in places where it's hard to find good uh, statisticians, um, we, we need to be doing more collaboration with the people who know how to do these more complex models. I don't know how to do them. Um, I, uh, I could go and buy a stats package and stick it on my PC and, or Apple and, and, and do something with it. Um, but by having folks that really know how to do this stuff, one can start to really get at, at the, the truth here. Now, as we look at neuropathy as the endpoint, we get these, these, um, these genome-wide associations to these so-called uh, Manhattan plots. Now, this particular Manhattan plot has a couple features to it. First of all, you can tell a real statistician did this analysis. Because if it was me, each of the chromosomes would be a different color, and it would be, each dot would be a little bit bigger, and we'd actually be able to see everything. Um, second, you know, I had to draw circles around the dots so you could actually see it um, be, because of that. Second thing, it resembles Manhattan, Kansas much more than Manhattan, New York. Um, and, and so we have a, a, a few hits, if you will, um, nothing up into the 10 to the minus 8th range, uh, but, but something to, to go forward. And then as we put in more of the, of the uh, adjustment factors, the clinical features, we do start to get some genome-wide significance with some of these, um, some of these features. So, what, what's shown here is a, a list of, of genes uh, that had some level of genome significance and, uh, as we looked at the functional data, um, had some sort of biologic plausibility. And I show this for two reasons. One, because we did it and the, the, the follow-on slides are featuring um, this particular example, the VAC14 gene, but also because this is not a very smart way to do it. We, we did this analysis this way. but. Really, what it does is it opens us up to be fooled by naming. So if anything has the word cell death in it, automatically it's the best candidate gene you've ever found for whatever the phenotype is that you're looking at. Because you can make a great story for why it is the gene. Whereas if it's KIAA7439, it doesn't really have a ring to it. You're, you're trying to, actually that probably does have a ring to it. But the, the, the idea that, that you're trying to use that and, and come up with some kind of plausibility, no one knows what those genes are. We, we don't have a clue. And yet, they might be the right gene in terms of, of, uh, of how they're going forward. And so, uh, you know, as we're doing uh, genome-wide studies, we need to be thinking about, um, are we being fooled by the naming? Um, or are there, uh, are there uh, and, and are there more things that are, that are going to be important for us? So taking that caveat in, in mind, we then looked at this, uh, this variant in, in BAC14 uh, that, that was one of, the, one of the candidate genes with functional uh, stability. This, this stabilizes one of the proteins that's involved in Charcot-Marie Tooth, an a, um, inherited peripheral neuropathy syndrome. And so looking at VAC14, uh, the variant, there was an increase in the risk of neuropathy. Uh, there was a gene dose effect, if you will, uh, that, that occurred, and so that, that was encouraging. 
Um, we then went in and, and did some studies with, um, with iPS cells, using some, some cells that have been differentiated into sensory neurons. And uh, I'll point down to one particular circle so they don't have to get lost in, in what is figure three of the paper. Um, what, what's shown in this particular um, panel right here is increasing dose of, of the, the, the drug and looking at the relative branching unit, so a, a measure of, of neural outgrowth um, in this particular study. And you see there's a difference between um, those that had had the VAC14 gene knocked down compared to those that had had a, 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 a scrambled control um, in the particular experiment. There's a series of, of additional studies that are shown in the paper to, to, to show this. And so that's interesting from a biologic plausibility standpoint that we've now shown in an in vitro system that we can see a difference between uh, the cells expressing and not expressing, uh, or at least not overexpressing or highly expressing uh, the VAC14 gene. And then one can go into VAC14 knockout mice, um, heterozygotes, the homozygotes aren't, aren't uh, viable. Um, and what one can see is that the, um, there's a difference between, sorry, this is a uh, ugly looking slide. The, the uh, journal hasn't redrawn it for us yet. So this is a, a little bit more raw than you're used to seeing. Uh, but the, the blue X are the, uh, the, the mice that are heterozygous for this gene and were treated with vehicle. And the red X are those same mice treated with the drug. And you can see a, a, a real drop in the, in the hindpaw um, withdrawal threshold, one of the many measures of, of neuropathy that was, was, uh, was performed in these, these particular mouse studies. But you can also see that even in the, the, um, even in the, the wild type mouse, um, there, there was a drop in neuropathy um, and, and differences did, did occur in here. So it, we have this, this in vitro data, um, that, or ex vivo data, that, that shows uh, that, that we, we have a difference in these genes. But it, it's all very unsatisfactory. And part of the reason why is that replication data sets for pharmacogenomics are very difficult to obtain. The clinical trial that I just showed you that we used for this discovery, we're not gonna go and do the trial again. You do a trial once, and then the winner, if you will, of, of the trial goes on and faces the next opponent uh, in, in the next clinical trial. You don't do a trial twice just so you have a data set on which to do uh, replication. Uh, it's not considered ethical in many, in many cases. So you, you have a situation where you, you're really stuck with a data set for discovery, and some level of biologic plausibility, hopefully with some mouse and, and cell line data to help back it up, um, and then have to really go forward into something more prospective in terms of intervention. Um, and so there's, there's a, a lot of opportunities to think of creative ways of, of generating the kind of data we need to, to really um, uh, be able to do more robust replication at the same level that someone working on diabetes or, or many other diseases um, have in terms of these large cohorts. The other thing is that, that um, I just want to go back to the title slide here. There's a, a bunch of different people that have to be involved in these, in these studies. And this is just a small list. This is, isn't even the, the complete author list. But the, the idea that a number of folks that are running the clinical trial, that are experts in the different types of phenotyping, uh, in, in the clinical trial that are experts in the iPS cells and in the, in the knockout mouse models uh, that, that are involved in high level statistical modeling. All these folks have to be involved and preferably from the start and not involved in the usual way. So often what will happen in statistics is that there, there's something uh, that is referred to fondly by statisticians as the statist statistical autopsy. They're, they're, br they're brought a data set, usually in pieces, and says, you know, can you fix this? As opposed to, hey, we're going to do a clinical trial. Can you help us design a really robust trial that will, will um, help us answer a question? Uh, and, and the idea that these folks get involved from the start it makes a, a world of difference. It's, it's a pain in the butt because, first of all, they, they don't uh, speak any language that I've ever uh, seen. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's no language known to man. It's all a, a version of Greek that has a lot of numbers in it. Um, they think in 12 dimensions, not, not uh, the, the ones that we, uh, we were involved in. Um, but uh, they can make us so much smarter as we go forward. And so you know, team science, not team as in tennis, where you have a team of physical therapists and psychologists and hitting coaches and whatever that help you, but team as in hockey, I guess that's what's on right now, uh, or basketball, where you take one of them out and you're in trouble. 
Um, and, uh, and, and so we need really more of that to, to be happening. Now, one of the things we also can do is once we have uh, enough literature is, is not do the discovery um, component, but go straight to a replication type component. So this is a study that, that uh, was, was, uh, came out a couple of months ago uh, from, from our group, just as you know, I had the slides ready so it was easy to use. Um, this is a study of ovarian cancer. Um, it's, a, it's really a, quite a boring study. Uh, it was docetaxel or paclitaxel, two chemical cousins of each other, um, and then combined with this one uh, dose of platinum drug, uh, normalized to blood level, um, and that was the randomization. And the, the end result was there was no difference in survival um, or overall survival or progression-free survival. And this has become the standard of care. So over, over a decade later, um, after this trial, uh, the, the standard of care for the treatment of ovarian cancer is still this, uh, this particular regimen. Now, if, you, if you're involved with ovarian cancer or know someone who's had it, and you might have gone to the ovarian cancer clinic, you will have noticed a number of women using walkers. And you think, how unfortunate this, dis this, uh, this disabled woman got ovarian cancer. You know, that's how unlucky. Well, typically what has happened is that she walked in, started her therapy, but the therapy is so toxic to the, the nerves, peripheral nerves in particular, uh, that she no longer can feel her, her hands uh, and has trouble buttoning her blouse and whatever else. Um, can't play the piano very well anymore, things like that. And has trouble feeling her feet. And to the point where she's stumbling and going to fall and hit her head, and so is now using a walker to be able to keep forward. And the way I was taught, and the people were taught around my era, uh, and really up until recently were taught, that in cancer, you need to almost kill the patient in order to kill the cancer. And that was the mindset that was done. And certainly, it was, it was appropriate when you take drugs like the alkylating drugs from, from back in the, in the 50s and 60s, where you know, the more you use, the more killing you get of, of the tumor. And so you need to surf that, that careful line. And, and so is, is a woman really willing to not have as much therapy to control her cancer in order to avoid the nerve toxicity? And, and that, that sort of uh, has kept things back. And so we were looking at this. We had this large data set. It had been maturing now um, for, for uh, a number of years. We had robust toxicities that had been audited. So we decided that we were going to go and do a discovery uh, study. But then we realized that there had been many discovery studies already done. There were also studies um, looking at uh, the you know, nerve function biology. There were inherited neuropathies. There was uh, some of the endpoints that had come out of these studies were pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic genes. And there was a lot of underpowered uh, data sitting out there already uh, that really was cluttering the literature. Uh, and, and so why not go in and just say, all right, any variant that has been shown in some study, no matter how small, to be associated with neuropathy, let's, let's evaluate it in this context. And so it was kind of a bummer because we were looking forward to doing a, you know, a million SNPs, and instead we ended up doing 1,261, which just seems so old school to do such a small number. But those were the ones that had some robust association uh, to, to go forward. And we took the 1,000 women from the study. Our statisticians pulled out, um, using a randomization algorithm, half of the patients and evaluated the 1,261 SNPs uh, and looked at the association with uh, a grade of peripheral neuropathy in those patients. 69 SNPs were, were uh, met our threshold, statistical threshold. And so these 69 variants went into the, the next 500 women um, on this study. Um, and there was some, some uh, directional correction there were four variants that, that came out to be important. And what, one thing from these, these uh, four variants and these four, uh, four separate genes, uh, firstly, uh, there was about a doubling of risk. So each one of the variants contributed something, but a doubling of risk is not enough to change practice. Uh, it's, it's enough to, to be interested, but you really need more than that in terms to, to change uh, practice. Usually somewhere around four times, uh, odds ratio of four will, will change practice. Um, and, and so that was, that was interesting. And, but if you, if you look and, and looked at the, the accumulation of these variants, the, 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 uh, when you look at all of the variants, the population attributable risk was, was about 85%. So a lot of the variability could be explained um, by these, these particular variants. 
And one could go in and, and look at a kind of a, I guess, variant dose effect. Um, the more variants you had, the higher your risk of neuropathy uh, uh, that, was, that was seen in this particular um, study. Well, that's interesting. It was uh, a replication, not a discovery data set, so that's, that's interesting. Um, but what about the original problem of needing to uh, really in induce toxicity in order to, to uh, cause these problems, to, to cause control of the disease? We looked at these variants, especially those in the, in the, in the highest uh, toxicity risk. We looked at a bunch of different cut points, but this is the one we put in the paper. Um, and basically, we could not find a way of separating out in terms of progression-free survival or overall survival based on these pr predictors of neuropathy. So what this does is opens up the idea that neuropathy is not required in order to control the cancer. That the genes that, at least from our study, appear to be regulating or, uh, or being associated with, I should say, uh, neuropathy are, are not predictors of outcome in, the, in these women. And so the idea that we can use this data to now do some additional prospective studies, and we are, um, but also to start doing some drug development. Now, some of these examples, uh, for example, BCL2, uh, there's already an anti-BCL2 therapy that was approved earlier this year uh, for, for a, uh, a, a type of, of uh, uh, lymphoma um, that, that is, is on the market. Um, and then there's at least the possibility of, of doing of intervention with some of these other types of genes. And so it opens up some, some drug development opportunities in addition to the possibility that it could predict prior to the start of therapy what the level of, of toxicity a, wom a woman might have. We, we've now gone further and um, using next generation sequencing technologies identified that there are some additional levels of risk uh, that are out there. And so in this particular study, we're taking patients that had a uh, very severe response to these medicines, so these, these anti-cancer drugs. So you give them one or two doses, and, and their nerves just melt away. Um, and in that case, um, the patients seem to have an underlying uh, charcot tooth a, a peripheral neuropathy syndrome. Now, if you go to a neurologist, they would probably pick it up every time. But if you go to an oncologist, they don't uh, really notice if someone shuffles in as opposed to walks in or if someone has a bit of a limp, or certainly don't look at someone's uh, a, a, you know, reflexes in, in most cases. They don't take people's shoes off and look and see whether they have high arches, which is often associated with these syndromes. They're, it's just not something that is, is part of normal practice. And so it's basically that iceberg under the water. Just because you didn't see it doesn't mean it won't sink the ship. Uh, and, and so we're now finding that, that and others are now too, uh, that these inherited neuropathy syndromes, the moderate penetrance versions are out there. They're, they're really not noticeable clinically very much, uh, and, and they're really waiting to, to cause problems. And so these types of discovery pieces are now allowing us to look at our preemptive strategies uh, to the point where we are now um, looking for uh, Charcot-Marie 2 syndrome genes, cardiomyopathy genes, a number of opathy genes prospectively in all of our patients uh, to identify those few that are at super high risk of these very severe toxicities. Now, part of it also uh, is trying to come back to those dollar signs that I mentioned earlier. Um, and that is, we can really use uh, the, the, um, the cost element in our favor as we try to take pharmacogenomics from being um, discovery science, including the, some of the stuff I just showed you, into implementation uh, type science. And so one example is with this antifungal drug called voriconazole. Uh, it's used to treat fungal infection, but we use it um, in a context of a cancer center um, to, as prophylaxis for our myeloid leukemia patients. So without prophylaxis, um, there is a, a, a high incidence, at least high in our, in our mind, uh, could be as high as 30% incidence of, of uh, death by fungal infection. But prophylaxis is reduced quite uh, dramatically. Well, as, as some of you will know, um, yeah, I took it out. Uh, some of you will know uh, the, this particular drug can be inactivated by a liver enzyme called the CYP2C19, and a, a substantial amount of the population has uh, an, an act, overactive ability to get rid of the drug. So it's, it's right around 28% of Moffitt Cancer Center patients, similar uh, across centers in the United States, uh, have a, an, a, a high ability to get rid of this, this drug. 
And so a, a, um, a normal dose for everyone else um, is, is very inadequate. And you can't really measure blood levels. You never get to the point where you're getting prophylaxis. You might as well not be using the medicine at all. Or you need to know to switch to a different uh, a medicine for, for this particular case. So there's a number of clinical trials and uh, clinical studies, rather, that have been performed on this. We had the clinical case down nicely. But if you go to your administrators and say, hey, I, we have this strong clinical case. We would really like to uh, implement this in our practice setting. What you'll get is that is a very, that's very interesting. We, we, you know, patient safety is paramount. Um, so we would like you to go and do another clinical trial, and we would like you to do some cost effectiveness study. But if you go and do some of those economic analyses using actual data uh, from, from your center, you get a very different response. So what's shown here is some analysis that was done uh, by, by Neil Mason at, at our place uh, around the, the cost of uh, fungal infections and the treatment of and the genotyping for fungal infections uh, in, in the context of, of myeloid leukemia. And basically what it came down to is that the myeloid leukemia patients that have a fungal infection cost us uh, just under $30,000 more to manage in the first year than the patients who do not get a fungal infection. And what happens is if you can prevent one case, you can pay for, for testing in spades. And this sort of situation, when we went to our administration and said, hey, we would like to do this. Here's the clinical case for doing this. Here's the economic using our actual data, not data from Kaiser or some other place, but our actual data. There was nowhere to go but yes. And so one of the things that we're doing now a lot is we try to take our, our pharmacogenomic examples and bring them all the way across the line to uh, patient care is working with these uh, economic folks, the folks in finance, the people who never thought we'd even have coffee with, much less uh, collaborate with, to make the case. Because if we can go in and say, here is the clinical case, because you wouldn't go forward without a good solid clinical case, and here is the economics, you can get to yes much quicker. And, and I drop that in there, uh, not so much for the NIH folks, because it's a different model here. But for the folks that are going to watch this later and see as, as they think about their health system, um, if you can make the dollars work, almost anything will happen. Uh, and, and so the idea that we only work on the uh, fine tuning our next gen sequencing machines um, is, is only going to get us so far. We need to have the rest of that um, going. And we don't need to do that. We don't need to be those people. But we need to be collaborating with those people to really make this, this forward. All right, so we're going to come back, uh, swing back to, uh, to the way genomics has started to change practice, um, especially in the area of, of cancer. So I, as I mentioned before, we have the, the, the germline genome for saying things like peripheral neuropathy. Um, the, the cancer genomics is, is really becoming uh, a normal part of, of care. And uh, often it's for the selection from amongst equals. So if you have a new diagnosis of lung cancer, there are a bunch of FDA approved options that might be the right ones for you if you have a particular genotype. And so having a small focus panel that allows you to make that decision um, is certainly normal practice in, in many, uh, if not all, of the uh, United States-based cancer centers. But after you run out of, of the, the first and second line options, which is where most of the randomized clinical trial data is, you have a patient that's fit, wants to do more, uh, you, you often don't know what to do next. I mean, you can pick a medicine, but what is really something that's going to actually help that person? And the idea that genomic information will, will influence that is, is becoming a reality, coming back to this tiebreaker type medicine. So you have these two clinical trials, or this clinical trial and this off-label use of a medicine. You know, what do you pick? Um, and, and the genomic data is often, often driving that. And it's, it's really changing the way practices happen. So it wasn't that long ago that a tumor in the colon would be called a colon cancer. Or maybe it has glandular formation under a hematoxylin eosin stain, so uh, it's an adenocarcinoma of the colon. Or maybe there was a KRAS mutation, mutation in the KRAS gene, and so it's a KRAS mutant adenocarcinoma of the colon. You can kind of see the theme that's building up on that, except that's just been blown on its head. 
Now this tumor is a P53 mutant, EP300 deleted, DDX3X lost cancer with all these variants of unknown significance. With the handwriting being one of our clinicians who before getting this report was a world expert on this disease and then after getting this report is a babbling idiot trying to figure out what in the world they're going to do with their life because they certainly don't understand cancer anymore. Um, what we found is that you know, there's the old uh, information, data, knowledge, wisdom. We have, we're generating lots of information, lots of data and information. We have very little knowledge and no wisdom. We, we are, are just so data rich that it's paralyzing. And so the idea that we can take this and try to move it forward is, is critical. And what we're seeing, you know, we're, we have initiatives now at the NIH that are helping drive this, but there is, is such a, a lack of, of um, informatically informed people involved on the clinical end. You have people that are involved in health IT, electronic medical records, but people involved in trying to take information about a patient and help turn it into a decision are, are, uh, are very few and, and far between. Uh, and so there's a, a big opportunity um, and a big problem sitting there as we sequence uh, all these patients. And you know, sequencing cancer patients is not something you, you might do every once in a while. At a, at a large center like ours, we're the third largest cancer center in the nation, uh, we're, we're sequencing uh, about 120 patients a week. So it's a lot. You know, it's, not, it's not something that we might do. Uh, it's something that we do. Uh, and, and so uh, it becomes a real problem very quickly as we go forward. But it also opens up uh, opportunities. So this is a patient with Lyle-Marrow sarcoma, very few FDA-approved drugs for this disease. They, uh, she ended up with a metastasis to the lung. She received this doublet of therapy for three months, and then it didn't work. This doublet for four months, and then it didn't work. Uh, this kinase inhibitor, which is FDA, was FDA-approved finally, um, is uh, for three months, and it didn't, no longer worked. She was fit. She wanted to do more, uh, but she didn't know what to do. And so we could just put her on whatever trial we happen to have available, um, or we could try to look further. And so we sequenced uh, her, her tumor. And it's not so important, uh, all the details, or I would have made it larger. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the findings that there came back, and there wasn't anything that, she, that her oncologist, um, who is an international expert in treatment of sarcomas, um, thought was actionable. Um, but because of all this problem, we've generated a, uh, a couple changes in the way we practice. First of all, uh, genomics, pharmacogenomics in particular, now has turned into the equivalent of radiology at our institution. You might like to read your own CT scans, but uh, a radiologist reads it anyway. And the same thing has now happened with tumor sequencing and germline, for that matter, sequencing. That every single case is read by the personalized medicine clinical service. And so they all get seen. A report is put in the electronic medical record. About a third of the time, the report is, we have nothing to add to the, the uh, pathology report. Call us if you need us. Worded a little bit nicer than that. About a third of the time, there's a few changes. You know, this, this trial is no longer open or no longer accruing. Um, you know, think about this option as well. And then a, another third of the time, there's some real complex uh, work that has to be done. We've also generated something called the Clinical Genomics Action Committee. Now, it's a molecular tumor board. But the reason we didn't call it a molecular tumor board is that too often molecular tumor boards are academic freak shows. You go there and you say, whoa, this particular patient we're talking about, she had a, a JAK2 amplification. So you'd go in this group and you say, she has a JAK2 amplification. And everyone around the room would go, whoa, that's crazy. That hasn't been seen very often. Next. As opposed to, what do we do with this? And is it actionable? And how do we act on it? Um, and, and so we have a large group of different disciplines that are all in the, in the one room trying to work through what, what happens. Um, and, and I'll come back to a point about that in terms of the way our basic science colleagues are contributing. But in this particular case, uh, uh, Mahila Druda, the uh, sarcoma uh, medical oncologist, whose patient this was, um, it, uh, was you know, presented the case. And a, a couple of the folks here, in particular, a, um, a couple of the, of the leukemia and lymphoma myelo uh, myeloma folks, they said, oh, oh, JAK2 amplification uh, is, is well known in our area. 
um, and at least with in vitro data and some of the initial clinical studies, makes a patient more responsive to uh, P PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, uh, in, you know, immunotherapy. Well, immunotherapy doesn't work in sarcoma, except in some of these patients that have these particular features that make them more, more, uh, more, uh, more, more relevant. And so based on the you know, report we worked up, she ended up going on, on a, 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 a PD-L1 inhibitor trial in August of 2014 and uh, is still on it. The previous therapies, the longest one worked for four months. This one's worked for a lot longer than that. It will, it will not cure her. She still has viable uh, disease that is stable, sitting there, not, not decreasing, not really resectable. Um, so it, it will, at some point in time, come and, and get her. But it has bought her way more time uh, than, than before. And you know, this is an anecdote that should not drive you, your practice in any way, shape, or form. But as we build up more and more of this, we start learning some of the rules whereby we can now objectively demonstrate, and that's future tense, uh, that this genomic sequencing really makes a difference in terms of, of outcomes. Now, whether it influences survival, I would certainly like it to. But even time on therapy um, is important. You know, those of you in the oncology area, the patients that haunt you, and certainly haunt me, are the ones that died three weeks before an FDA-approved therapy or a clinical trial even of a therapy became available that, that switched to a more curative type environment. You know, those, those gastrointestinal stromal cell tumors where now, you know, once imatinib became available, they became a, a, if not curable, at least lifelong controllable disease. And if, if I had had the drug three weeks earlier, that patient would still be alive. And so the idea that we're trying to cure people is definitely true. But the idea that we're trying to bridge them, have them living quality life, uh, a quality life long enough is, is also an important part of this. And we need to be thinking about those kinds of endpoints as well. Last little piece on this is we have um, several of our cell biology and molecular oncology PhD colleagues that now come to every one of these meetings. And the reason they came initially uh, was because we were, we had examples of patients with, with variants where there was no human data, no clinical trial data, nothing really, um, but there was some cell line data. And so we're like, well, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. If we, if, if we had some data, um, we, we could try to devise a, a more objective way of treating this patient than just picking a trial we happen to have open. Um, and so um, we looked at, had, had a couple of the papers. Well, it turns out the papers were from our own institution. There was a guy down the hall that was doing this work and so we said, well, could you come and actually like, tell us the story behind the story? You know, well, when he came, he said, oh, yeah, this variant, uh, you know, it does, you know, at least in cell lines, it doesn't respond to serafinib, but it does to some other drug. And they're, very, they're terrified that someone's going to mistake them for a clinical doctor. You know, I'm, I'm, listen, I, I'm not a clinical doctor, I'm a, but, but I do know this about cells. I do know this about mice. And often, you know, we're at a situation where we're, we're trying to choose up from amongst a couple of equal therapies. And even some cell line or mouse data might be enough to say, well, let's go with this versus this. Because we're not talking about therapy and no therapy. We're talking about what we use first, and if it doesn't work, what we use second. So the idea, you know, even when you look at a clinical trial in your favorite journal, um, you'll see this, you know, survival curves, and they're usually wide enough that you can see a difference between the two. Um, and you think, oh, there's winner and loser. No, there's first line therapy and second line therapy. You know, and you know, we often will say, oh, the, the winner of that trial was X. But then if we go to a patient after the winner stops working, we don't say, well, we're gonna try to loser therapy on you now. It, rather, it's the, it's the next best option. And so our whole mindset in terms of how we do trials, how we interpret them, how we go forward needs to be changed as we try to apply things like pharmacogenomics in, in, into practice. So I'm going to skip that in the interest of time and, and hit the, the last, uh, last little bit. Um, you know, one of the things is just a reminder that there are a lot of genomes that patients have. You know, this, it's not just the germline and the somatic. Matter of fact, within the tumors, there are a bunch of different genomes. It's not like there's lung cancer. It's a bunch of different types of flavors of lung cancer uh, within that, that particular mass. Um, and so we, we don't really have good models for thinking about in a in vivo or, or ex vivo setting, um, how do we deal with all these different populations? You know, the, the population um, 
uh, the, the folks dealing with, with uh, population evolution or whatever you want to call it um, really haven't uh, jumped into the practicalities of what we're trying to think about and how do we, we uh, and dev evolve new, new ways of therapy. And I think as pharmacogenomics matures in, in many of the diseases we're working on, we're, we're going to be seeing more and more of that, those elements. The, the last little piece is as we go into people, uh, we, we really need to have more diversity. So uh, when we talk about American being a, a melting pot, but really in some cases it's really more like a carton of eggs. It, it's, a, it's a bunch of people living in the same place, uh, but not necessarily um, in the, with the same diversity. And the reason this, this matters is that this is a study that is, is not yet published, but hopefully will be soon, where we looked at um, 100, 127,000 patients over these three disease areas over these different time periods. This Todd Nepper, myself, and two of our FDA colleagues. And basically what we saw is that over time, there was a, a doubling of the number of countries that were involved in pivotal clinical trials, the approval trials for the FDA. So globalization has occurred, no surprise, but we just quantitated it in a little bit bigger fashion. And you can see, um, you know, over time, here's the different countries that got involved, and, you know, that, that's great. But what we found is that in 1997, just over 90% of the clinic, pivotal clinical trial patients were self-described as, uh, as Caucasian. In 2012, and we now have 2014 data, it had gone all the way down to only 82% of the clinical trial participants being Caucasian. Basically, a lot of the growth that had occurred meant that there were more white people on trials, except they were from the Ukraine and Argentina, as opposed to actual diversity happening with globalization. And that matters. I mean, look around the room. Look around wherever you're going to be tonight. Look around every place. There's a bunch of people from a bunch of places uh, that are, are uh, needing help, um, just even within this country. Um, and and the, the idea that we need to be doing these, these trials uh, is important. And at the pharmacogenomic level, it matters. What's shown here is a number of different uh, genetic predictors uh, for pharmacogenomics. And what's on the x-axis is different countries separated by continent. So here's Africa, here's Asia, here's Europe, uh, here's the Middle East, here's uh, Central and South America. Sorry, here's Central America and here's South America. And uh, using the, the, the um, data from the New England Journal papers, here is the predicted average uh, weekly dose of warfarin, very low dose in, in many of the uh, Asian countries, except India, which is much more similar to Europe in terms of its, its metabolism, much higher dose needed in Africa, et cetera. Here is a risk of GI toxicity from, uh, from one of the anti-malaria drugs. Again, a lot of diversity. Um, risk of muscle pain from simvastatin. Again, a lot of diversity. And then if you look within countries, uh, taking the New England Journal study, um, here's the average dose for a, a U.S. population. Um, very similar in Mexico, the uh, Nigerian and Ghana populations need a much higher dose. The Chinese and Japanese populations a much lower dose. But there's a lot of variability even within that, that uh, geographic label. And the, the reason for, for um, bringing this point up is that as we extend pharmacogenomics into the clinic, we, we need to be making sure that we capture some of this diversity. We're doing a project now with, with China. Uh, they have 56 ethnic groups in China. So there's the Han Chinese that everybody knows about, and then there's a whole bunch of other groups. And, you know, 1% of the Chinese population is a lot of people. So these groups are not very common, <laughs> except it's, you know, millions of people um, that, are, that are in each of these groups. And so the idea of trying to understand the diversity you know, we heard about from a couple lectures ago, uh, population genetics. We, we need to know this sort of data, not just so we can understand where we came from, but understand where we're going in terms of trying to make good health policy and individualized therapy uh, for, for, for our, our patients. So uh, I'm going to st uh, stop with this particular slide uh, on the Precision Medicine Initiative. And the way I view the Precision Medicine Initiative is it's a 3D printer. It's going to be a massive million man or whatever person cohort, the majority of the money spent for that. But it is a 3D printer. The 3D printer is pretty cool. But what's even cooler is what you do with it. And so this cohort that is being built is the start of some amazing science. 
And so I would encourage all of you, no matter what area you're working in, to not be thinking like we often do, what a blank waste of money. But rather, how can this be a strategic advantage for helping answer some of the questions that we've been, been working on? And I'm not part of the PMI. I don't even have a t-shirt with the PMI label on it. Um, I'm an outsider looking at it. But after I got over the, what a waste of money this is going to be part, I looked and said, wait a minute, this could be really powerful if we get involved and help shape it now. Because 3D printers can make some really stupid little plastic toys or can make a new valve for a heart. Uh, and uh, it's up to us what we use our 3D printer for. Um, but, but I think there's a great opportunity to take pharmacogenomics and really push it uh, to the point where it's known to be useful and areas where it's known to not be useful as opposed to where we are now where we think we have some hits, we think we have some misses, but we really don't know uh, what, what it, what's all about. So I'll stop at that point, a little bit of time for questions, and thank you very much for your attention.